I, I disregarded that call. I uh, told him to uh, call me when something more significant happened. Um, I got another call uh, subsequent to that call, and this time it was a more uh, intense tone in the, in the guard's uh, voice. He was very, clearly very frightened. Um, he said there was a, uh, a bright, glowing red object hovering outside the front gate. It was oval-shaped. Uh, he had all the other guards out there with their weapons drawn. Right after that call, I woke up my commander who was on a rest period, uh, uh, Fred Mywald, a retired colonel now, uh, and uh, told him about the phone calls. As I was telling him about the phone calls, my weapons started going down uh, one after the other. They went into a no-go condition, what we call no-go condition. They were unlaunchable. Um, <clears throat> We lost uh, somewhere between uh, six and eight weapons that morning. Uh, within minutes of having received that second phone call of uh, a UFO hovering outside the front gate. Uh, uh, again that morning, we were, after reporting it to the uh, command post, uh, we, were, we were informed that a similar, very similar incident happened at Echo Flight. Uh, I was at Oscar Flight. Uh, they lost all ten of their weapons and under similar circumstances, very similar circumstances, where UFOs were sighted over the launch facilities. Uh, they, had, they had maintenance crews and security crews out there that had spent the night and they were reporting UFOs over those sites. Uh, <clears throat> and the commander of, of that flight was uh, Eric Carlson. Uh, he's, he uh, also separated as a captain, and the deputy commander was uh, Walt uh, Fiegel, uh, retired as a lieutenant colonel. Uh, we have those witnesses uh, that I just mentioned, the, the names I just mentioned, are, uh, have, have spoken of this event before, and they will back up this story. Uh, we also have documentation. Uh, that I received uh, through FOA requests from the Air Force uh, outlining the, the echo flight incident and including in, in that documentation a reference to UFOs. We have um, telexes uh, covering this incident uh, and in one telex it, it says uh, the fact that no apparent reason for the loss of 10 missiles can be readily identified is cause for grave concern to this headquarters. Uh, this was from SAC headquarters. <clears throat> so we've received, we've got those telexes. I've got about 12 witnesses that'll verify parts of this story, including um, uh, of a man who investigated the incident afterwards for the Air Force. And you'll hear a little bit more about that with, from the next witness. Uh, and also uh, another guard that uh, witnessed the UFO in that same time period and another officer who retired full colonel who had other reports of UFOs. <clears throat> and ciliary to that, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got the complete report on a Minot, North Dakota incident. That was Minot Air Force Base, North Dakota, which happened in August of 1966, very similar. UFO sighted over uh, uh, missile silos, and also a UFO incident that was re that was investigated by the Air Force immediately after our incident within a week. I'm willing to testify to the truth of all these matters that I've spoken about in front of Congress under oath. Thank you. March 16, 1967. Reports of UFOs at Malmstrom seem to demonstrate an extraterrestrial interest in America's nuclear forces. Early in the morning, uh, and I get a call from the topside uh, flight security controller, a guard, and he said that uh, a few of the uh, guards had been seeing some strange lights flying around in uh, uh, very strange ways, you know, making uh, very rapid movements stopping, making uh, very sharp turns, uh, so I, I just kind of discounted it and basically hung up on him. He calls back about five minutes later, this time he's very 
agitated. He's very, he's yelling into the phone, screaming. Uh, uh, Sir, there's a, a large red glowing object that's hovering right outside the front gate. Lieutenant Salas ordered the guards to secure the perimeter, and he went to inform his commander. At this point, the warning lights in the control center went off, and the missiles shut down, one after another. What made this event even stranger, if that's possible, was the fact that the exact same thing had happened one week earlier at Echo Flight, approximately 25 miles away. A lengthy investigation was conducted, but no positive cause for the shutdowns was ever found, despite extensive and concentrated effort. Missile officers are highly trained engineering and science types for the most part. And uh, the air police, these people go through special security schools. They have secret clearances, that sort of thing. They carry weapons. They're, you know, they're highly trained people. So I think it's very significant when people of this caliber uh, make sightings. The tragedy is that we don't know all the details of the reports. They've been kept secret. I was there for another two years at Maelstrom. This incident was never brought up again in any of the, our briefings and we were told not to talk to anybody about it. Over the years, uh, it became more and more clear to me that what occurred was uh, something that can't be explained uh, uh, as, uh, as originating from, from Earth. I'm quite impressed with the Malmstrom case, not only because of the people involved, and there were quite a few people involved. It wasn't just a flyover by a flying saucer, oh, what went by? But the impact on the equipment that was there, I mean, it's kind of scary when you think of uh, missiles. It's important to bear in mind that these missiles are designed to be independent systems. So if you do something to affect one missile, it won't affect all the other missiles because they're totally separate. So whatever caused this event was able to shut down a whole variety of missiles that were spread around a large geographical area around the launch control complex. Fewer than 10 years later, five strategic air command bases, including Malmstrom, are placed on high priority alert as a result of repeated reports of UFOs over nuclear weapons storage systems. In 1975, right along the northern tier frontier, in many of the different Air Force bases, Falcon Bridge in Ontario, Canada, Loring Air Force Base in Maine, Wordsmith Air Force Base in Michigan, Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota, and Malmstrom Air Force Base in uh, Montana, all experienced a series of unidentified objects. Some of these were explained away as helicopters, some of them were explained away as unidentified aircraft, some of them were called UFOs, but the general theme was that Air Force Base was being violated at random by a series of aircraft that should not have been there. At each of the bases, official logs record eyewitness accounts of the UFOs, and they are tracked by radar as well. In each case, the UFO reportedly hovers above the base, specifically the weapon storage area, for up to 40 minutes. All attempts to intercept or positively identify the UFO from the ground or with fighter jets in the air fail. The incursions are brought to the attention of the Commander-in-Chief of NORAD, the North American Air Defense Command. An investigation ensues. The initial um, thinking behind the, the unidentified objects over the Air Force bases in the northern tier was thought to be potentially Russians or else some other enemy. The only information we have is that the eyewitnesses described objects that behaved in a very unusual fashion. They, they glowed red, for example, and it doesn't sound like any technology that the Soviets had at that time. Another theory is that the UFO incursions were a type of readiness self-test to check the security of the bases in the event of an attack. But if it was a test, the bases performed poorly. The Air Force personnel were completely at sea as to what was happening. They were actually calling the law enforcement people in Great Falls, Montana for help. 